Hello and welcome to my simplified version of Theories of Sleep essay. So remember the main fo focus within this essay is remembering the AO2 skills. So remember to ensure that your evaluation is absolutely key because you get a majority of your marks for that. Ensure that everything is clear and concise. So focus on spelling, make sure your spag etc is all sorted out in the essay. Now in the first part of the essay obviously you can have your introduction. Now make sure this is a very brief and um, welcoming introduction to the examiner. The main focus here is you aren't going to get an awful lot, lot of marks for describing what you're doing in your introduction. So focus on the two reasons for sleep, so outline restoration evolutionary and focus and explain that throughout each one of the main theories there. Then when you move on to your first paragraph it's going to again be a very very brief introductory theory part here. So you can outline that your first part of the essay is going to be focusing on restoration theory, particularly outlined in the theory by Oswald in 1980, who talks about the different functions of REM sleep and slow wave sleep. So outline this very clearly in there. So make sure you have got that all sorted for you. Okay, so once you've got that initial introductory paragraph open over and done with the restoration theory for Oswald in 1980, you're going to move straight into slow wave sleep and bodily repair. And this is the main discussion angle which you're going to go for. So when we're in slow wave sleep, go, the growth hormone is generally released. And this then helps with the tissue regeneration as well as protein synthesis. So obviously the evidence that we've got to support this is Vancouterin Platt and Sassin et al. Now both of these are supporting this, so make sure within your language and your AO2 approach you are stating this. So very simply, Vancouter and Platt found that there was a positive correlation between growth hormone and slow wave sleep, therefore this is showing that the growth hormone and slow wave sleep are linked to one another. Um, Sassin et al, sleep cycle, when it reversed, it was showing that growth hormone was reversed as well, which then is showing that slow wave sleep again are inextricably linked with the mechanisms of um, slow wave growth hormone. So it's essential that we recognize those parts within that first paragraph. Now in paragraph three, what you're going to be looking at is slow wave sleep and bodily repair, and this time you're going to be linking it to exercise. So when we exercise, um, we should expect that we're going to need more slow wave sleep because our muscles are increasingly more damaged and those muscles have been ripped and torn apart during that intensive exercise session. So our two bits of supporting evidence for this are by Shapiro and Harmon here. Both again, using your AO2 language to ensure that you are supporting this. So Shapiro, mouth when runners slept one hour longer, obviously showing that slow wave sleep was needed to repair the damage. And Harmon was also supporting and people need slow wave sleep after intense periods of exercise. Again, both of these are supporting the link between slow wave sleep and its, and its importance in bodily repair, especially after exercise, which can be very damaging for the body. Now, this is where we get into a bit of an evaluation for slow wave sleep and bodily repair. So we move on to Horn and Minard in 1985, which is going to be a criticism of our over overarching theory here. Now, participants were given numerous tasks which were considered exhausting, but they did not sleep for longer, which is obviously contradictory to what we've already stated from Shapiro and Harmon. So this questions the link between slow wave sleep and bodily repair. Maybe it is not as simply linked as we once thought, and maybe there's other avenues we need to explore. Now, in paragraph five, we're going to be looking at REM and brain recovery. And the evidence, obviously, this is when we look at babies, they generally need more REM. And this is because neural pathways are forever developing and there is a big substantial growth happening there. Now, Siegel in 2003, um, again, is supporting evidence for this, who demonstrates when we've got platypus, um, who are considered immature at birth, they need eight hours of REM sleep a day. Meanwhile, a dolphin, who's not considered to be immature at birth, needs zero hours of REM sleep a day highlighting the main function of REM sleep is for brain recovery. Now, in paragraph six, it's going to be moving on to REM and brain recovery, and this is the evidence to support it, really. Now, we've got Siegel and Rogowacki here in 1988, who is supporting evidence. And they said that REM allows for breaking neurotransmitters, which then allows those neurons to regain sensitivity, allowing for those neurotransmitters to be efficiently passed through the system. The evidence that supports this is with the MOIs, um, which is a de anti-depression drug, um, this, which has a main side effect of reduction in REM sleep. Now, the drug in itself regains neuron sensitivity, sensitivity therefore meaning that REM is no longer needed. This is really just reconfirming the relationship that we've already established, that REM and brain recovery are linked to one another. Now, we've got to ensure that you are focusing on that part in terms of this paragraph, because there isn't any critical evidence against this. 
Now, when we move on to paragraph seven, this is where we're going to talk about Exe et al. 2013. Now, again, I'm pretty much sure you all are aware of this. This is an absolutely important bit of evidence that you need to include within your essays. Reason being why, it's 2013 and it's been mentioned in the examiner's report. So it's absolutely essential that this is in your essay. I cannot stress that enough within this video. So with Nick Z, now this is a really just a whistle-stop tour of him. Now he states that sleep has evolved as a primary purpose of restoration. So he's saying that everything that we have so far covered has really been led to a result of our evolutionary processes. An example of this is through the glymphatic system, which when we sleep removes toxins such as amyloid beta from our brain, therefore preventing any negative side effects of these toxins on our mental health. Um, therefore, this really just reconfirms that sleep and restoration are in inextricably linked to one another, meaning that they are just as important and the main function of sleep is to restore our body back to 100%. Now, the case studies that we're going to use for paragraph eight, now this is going to be have to be very, very concise and to the point with this. We're going to use Peter Tripp and Randy Gardner. Now, Peter Tripp is supporting evidence for the restoration theory here, who had 201 hours um, awake. Uh, however, when being awake for that long, he showed negative symptoms such as paranoia and hallucinations. This is then therefore showing to us that sleep is necessary to avoid any negative symptoms or side effects of sleep deprivation. Meanwhile, Randy Gardner is really a criticism of this, who demonstrates when he was awake for 260 hours awake, he showed no negative side effects. Maybe that, maybe there's another function within our body that then offers um, and prevents those negative symptoms from really impacting on our lives, like what happened with Peter Tripp. However, maybe he was just not awake for long enough for those new functions to kick in. So the example of this is micro sleep, which I've written in bold letters and put there for you. So that is. Now the next section that we're moving on to, um, bear in mind that they are two very clear sections. So we've got restoration theory and evolutionary theory now. So evolutionary theory, um, as we're going to look at, the reasons for sleep have evolved over time as a result of natural selection. So therefore, by having these set of characteristics put in place, this therefore allows for a species to survive and continue reproducing as a result. The four main theories are as following, um, energy conservation, predator avoidance, foraging requirements and waste of time theory. Now, the first one we're looking at here is energy conservation, um, which really needs to start off explaining. Um, so it provides a period of enforced inactivity, meaning that little or no energy is then spent. Um, usually this is small animals that have to have this enforced period of activity due to them having high metabolic rates. Webb uh, would have called this and labelled it the waste of time theory, um, because they are wasting time because they don't want to burn energy, which is unnecessary. Now, Zeppelin and Wright Schaffern in 1974 is supporting evidence again, and what they showed to us was smaller animals with high metabolic rates need to sleep more, therefore supporting the energy conservation theory. However, there is counter evidence to this. As we know, sloths in captivity need to sleep for 20 hours a day. They are very large animals, so therefore it's completely different to what has been originally suggested in the energy conservation theory. Maybe it's not giving us a full picture and maybe another evolutionary explanation needs to be considered, such as predator avoidance, waste of time or foraging requirements. Now, the next one you're moving on to paragraph 11 is predator avoidance, which simply is prey sleep less, predators sleep more, because prey can, can afford um, can't afford to go to sleep for very long because they need to spend as much time maximising um, their foraging for food as well as ensuring that they are less vulnerable. So prey when sleep um, are, tend to be when they are least vulnerable, so at night time when predators may be less active. Now Lesku in 2006 is contradictory evidence to this, who states that there's no relationship between sleep and predator avoidance, so therefore maybe another explanation is a better explanation such as foraging requirements, because maybe there needs to be a trade-off between food and sleep requirements. Now in paragraph 12 we're going to look at the waste of time theory. Now this was previously suggested by Webb here, um, but it's medis that really brings us to life, and he, said, he states here, sleep helps prey stay out of danger as they will be hidden. Now, Siegel in 2008 really starts to develop this idea further for um, Medis, who states that sleep um, more, or pray sleep more as being awake, they are more likely to be injured. So therefore, it's a bit of a trade-off between energy conservation as well as staying out of danger. 
So it means that as a result that this species is going to exist and it's going to survive for an awful lot longer. Our example of this is the little brown bat who is most active when the predators are asleep and also most active when its prey is awake. Um, so it can feed, it can reproduce and do all those things which means the continuation of that species. Now the penultimate paragraph we're looking at is paragraph 13 which is maybe the one that's going to take a bit more time to develop and really um, start to investigate further. Now this is all based on foraging requirements so perhaps sleep can be simply put down to food source. So as we know carnivores tend to have, eat meat, um, obviously as we know, lions, etc., they eat meat. Um, as meat it is a high energy source, so therefore they will have a very good um, source to rely on in terms of providing them energy. Meanwhile, herbivores have a poor energy source, so therefore they're going to need to spend more time foraging to get more food to obviously meet the energy requirements of the species. An example of this is pandas. Pandas tend to forage for 10 to 16 hours a day. They are obviously omnivores, but tend to eat more herbivore sources. So they send fo focus on bamboo, plantation, etc. Now, that is a, a good example there, obviously, how foraging is essential um, and there needs to be a trade-off. Now, Capellini in Eto in 2008 found there's no relationship between body mass and sleep. So really, it's criticising the energy conservation theory. Um, they found that a trade-off between sleep and foraging really needs to happen. So therefore, therefore, possibly this is the best explanation for the evolutionary reasons as to why we sleep. However, we cannot ignore them all in isolation because they all contribute and allow us to explore why we need to sleep and maybe some of the more instinctual reasons why sleep occurs. And now for the conclusion. So there's no universal reason for sleep, but we know we need sleep for its essential reasons, such as obviously avoiding prey as well as restoration to our body. So we cannot ignore it as one function in terms of isolation of each one of these theories. They are all interlinked with each other and they all they start to give us a greater picture as to what sleep provides us and animals. So when you're doing your conclusion, make sure you're really emphasising that point. There is no universal reason. Now, if you've got any questions, let me know.